Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Baker Street uh, monthly live stream. Hope you've had a good month since last month. Uh, today's theme is all about funding property deals. We'll be looking at uh, funding property deals after we all are released from this lockdown experience. If this is your first time ever at any kind of Baker Street meetup or whatever, just let us know first time in the uh, in, in, in the comments. I can see... Uh, uh, who is a regular and who is not. And also, I know that when we do our live meets, we normally meet up on the last Wednesday of every month in central London. Uh, we get about 300 people turn up to our live events. It's the largest networking event uh, in the UK. But what I'd love to know is where you are watching this from uh, today. So if you just put your town um, in the comments, I can just see where, you're, where you all are. Uh, it'll be great to see whether there's anyone watching from abroad. I know we've had a few people watching from uh, all sorts of places uh, in the past, which is lovely to uh, hear. So doing plenty of first timers, plenty of regulars, that's good to see. Um, so once we come out of lockdown and we are able to, we will be resuming our monthly live events. They take place in, um, uh, well, they take place near Baker Street, actually, in central London on the last Wednesday of every month. When we do come out of lo uh, lockdown, we'll continue with the live stream as well. So we intend to do one live stream a month, uh, which will be more of a chat show, if you like, bringing in uh, some great guests with, an with, with very, very fascinating perspectives on property and just having a chat about some of the, uh, the, the common topics and themes that people are asking about. Now, you guys are all chatting in the um, chat window there. Great. Do that. Uh, I think this online experience is rather unique because uh, as well as listen to us talk, you can now also chat and interact in the uh, comments section. So we've got three speakers uh, tonight, three guests, if you like, and we're all talking about funding tonight. So I'm gonna talk to, we're gonna talk to um, uh, Helen, um, Helen Chorley. She's an angel investor, former banking background, uh, but she backs a lot of entrepreneurs and their deals and projects as well. Uh, so she'll be talking about really what makes an entrepreneur backable, uh, what sort of deals that she's looking to back and uh, how or whether that any of that has changed as a result of COVID-19 and whether out of lockdown she'll be um, having a different approach. Um, we'll be talking to Susanna Cole. She's an accomplished investor based in Bristol, uh, has an extensive residential portfolio, sourced more than 200 properties, worked extensively with private investors as well. And she'll be sharing the perspective from um, the investor's point of view when you're looking to raise JV finance from potential JV partners. And we're also joined by Evan Main Donald, who's our token bloke on the panel uh, today. Uh, he'll be, share, he's an accomplished developer. He's got development projects in the pipeline with more than 100 million of uh, pound of GDV. So what are the challenges for uh, developers in funding their deals? Um, and how is that changing after uh, with COVID-19? So we'll be, we'll be covering all of that as well. So um, the format is that I'll be having a little bit of a chat with our three guests. Um, then uh, we'll be kind of asking a few questions and discussing a few things. And there's plenty of opportunity to have uh, your questions answered. So keep them in the chat or put them in the chat and uh, bring them to us. Now, we're gonna try something new here just for a bit of fun and see how it works. Now on YouTube, there's something called a super chat uh, button, which is uh, on the bottom. Now you press that, you do have to pay a couple of quid though. So you do have to sort of put your hand in the pocket to uh, do a super chat. But if you do a super chat, then um, you'll get your question uh, asked to our speaker straight away. So let's see. Uh, who uh, wants to have a go at doing that. Um, so uh, what's been happening this month? Well, I apologize for my hair. It's uh, locked down again. I've uh, had my, um, uh, well, I haven't had my barber, so I've done it myself, actually. This is my own sort of creation. We're all getting into, uh, we're all learning things that we have never, ever done before. Getting a few people from all over the country. It's lovely to see. Uh, no one from abroad yet. We had all sorts of uh, Dubai-based people and all sorts last time, but we're getting people from all over the country, Huddersfield, the whole work. So that's very, very uh, nice to um, see. So 
Um, what was I going to say? I was going to tell you a little bit about, uh, oh, make sure you if, you, if you're new to this channel, I forgot, you must subscribe. You must subscribe and hit the bell icon because we put out new content each and every week. I must thank all of you because we, we're 17,600 subscribers now in pretty much a year. So I really thank you guys for supporting the uh, channel. We've got some great videos coming up in the next week. Um, we've done a fantastic series on bounce back loans, uh, which has been very popular. We did our first, and I'll put some links in the description later on, but we did one bounce back video on uh, basically how to apply for a bounce back loan uh, if you are a property entrepreneur. Uh, bounce back loans have been introduced by the government. You can actually claim up to £50,000, which is interest free for a year. And uh, if you take it on after that, there's five years to pay and you can do that for each business that you have. Uh, so we, in that video, we talk about uh, basically how to apply. Um, in the second video, we talk about um, uh, basically the process and uh, con comparing and contrasting some of the banks and how they've been to property investors. In the third video that we'll be releasing next week, we'll be talking specifically about how you can use and deploy those bounce back funds for your property business. So look out for that. You'll get it if you subscribe and hit the bell icon, you'll get notified as soon as it uploads. Um, the other video we got coming out in the next couple of days is one on online property auctions. Now, any of you guys who have done a property auction during lockdown will know that it's different. It's not all hotel rooms and um, bidding off the chandelier anymore. It's bidding off the mouse or whatever you do. So um, I was at an online uh, auction last week and we blogged it and uh, we got some tips there about online bidding strategies and how to play the auction property auction game when you're doing it online so that's all coming up next week uh, so again subscribe hit the bell icon we'll notify you as soon as um, that uploads right so um, oh, uh, you'll probably see on our screen here our various Instagrams and all of that. Um, what we do like to see is how you guys are watching and enjoying uh, this live stream. Hopefully you've got a glass of wine or, well, hell, why not a bottle of wine? And you're just sitting and enjoying this live stream. Do take a picture. We love to see how you're enjoying um, the live stream uh, and um just post it on, and I always get this wrong. Is it hashtag? It's at uh, on the page, on the stream, on the tweet. What, what is it? At at Baker Street Property Meet, and is that that's our Instagram, isn't it? Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Facebook on Baker Street uh, Property Meet Facebook group, and and all that jazz. Or or hell, just fax the photo to us. I mean, uh, that might be fun. Uh, if you guys under 30 have got no idea what a fax machine is, then just uh, Google it later on, and uh, I'm sure you can find that out. Right, okay, so, um, oh, we oh we got someone who's done a super chat, but they haven't asked a question. All right, okay, yeah, you can ask a question um, when you do a super chat. All I can see is that you've done a super chat, but you haven't asked a question. Okay, we'll get on to that. Uh, later on. Good. I can see everyone is uh, nicely chatting. We've got 520 people uh, online now, so that's nice to, to see. Okay, so let's um, get straight on to our uh, guests. I think you guys have had enough of me waffling on. Um, you want to hear from our guests? We've got three eminent guests. Um, my first guest is uh, Helen Chorley. Now, Helen Chorley is an angel investor. And, um, uh, w well, actually, she's an angel investor. She invests in a lot of entrepreneurs. She backs a lot of uh, property entrepreneurs and their projects. She's had a, ha had a career in the city as a, a bit of a trading background and all of that. Uh, so she, uh, she's got a good background, really, in deals and uh, dealing with people and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, Helen and I are actually uh, doing a bit of telly together. We're going to be on a show called Property Elevator on Sky. Property Elevator is a bit like Dragon's Den, where um, a bunch of us actually sort of, uh, well, you guys come along and pitch your property projects to four angel investors, and uh, we fund them, really. Uh, so uh, I invited Helen on the uh, show today to really sort of find out how she ticks, really, because she's going to be one of my competition on the show 
uh, pitching for investment for for your deal. So uh, I thought, what better opportunity than uh, have a have a topic of funding and invite Helen to find out uh, what makes her tick and uh, what sort of entrepreneur she's looking to pack. So Helen. Hello, Renjen. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, now I need to be careful what I'm going to say, don't I? Because you're sussing me out. I'm sussing you out, and I'm hoping you'll <laughs> reveal all your uh, yeah, all, all, all your secrets and all of that. But listen, Helen, tell us tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into being an angel. Sure. Um, well, as you said, my background is finance. I used to work on the foreign exchange trading floor of an American investment bank and did that for a number of years till I. Um, I blew my health out spectacularly, just pre-credit crunch. So I left in 2008. I uh, took a little while to get better and tried a few different things, including, I, I mean, I've always loved property. So I, I thought I wanted to be a home stager because um, I really like design. Then I tried it and <laughs> I realized that was more hard work than, than being on a trading floor. So I guess I went back to what I'm good at kind of, and what my background has given me, the, the, the transferable skills is an understanding of risk and how risk is priced. So I'm very numbers based. That's, that's what I, I like to look at. I certainly look at the person as well as the deal when I'm assessing something, but I'm very kind of numbers and, and I'm a spreadsheet geek, I suppose, at heart. All right. OK, so um, and, and you live in Malta currently, isn't it? Uh, I do, but not right now because you're stranded. <laughs> I'm stranded. It's not bad. I'm in the north northwest of England, where I grew up, so I'm in my childhood home. But yeah, I came over to well, we were filming, weren't we? The promos for Property Elevator. Yes. And um, yeah, and Malta closed the airport that night, so I've been living out of a hand luggage sized suitcase for eight weeks now. And let me tell you, that's given me a whole new level of patience, tolerance, resourcefulness that I didn't know I could have. And my parents, to be fair, have been very good and patient. <laughs> OK, so tell me when you actually um, what I want to know is um, what what do you look for? Uh, are you looking at um, the property deal or the entrepreneur first? Oh, excellent question. Uh, I guess really it's the person. Because it, it can look like a great deal. And if you have a number of us, as, as we frequently do, have a number of deals in front of you, how do you choose between those? Um, and actually, the, the answer to that is that you diversify and you put a bit in each. But if it was a choice of this or this, what would it come down to? It would come down to the person. Absolutely. Do I believe, ultimately, that mm. this person will do right by me? Um, you know, I, there is a whole list kind of I go through on the deal side of things I have my kind of rates and rents kind of uh, formula I suppose that, that so you I say that again what, what is that let me take rent. a note here go on it's, yeah um, actually it's in um I go into that in the, the property investor news magazine mm -hmm. I think it was January I did an article and I there's my little points they're more for kind of the assessing the deal they're how I do due diligence on the deal mm -hmm. well tell us a little bit about that then sure I mean it, it's kind of very common sense stuff, but it's establishing it does the does this deal match my criteria? So it's kind of the amount, the time frame, the experience, looking at exits, what's the security, what are the legals like? Um, like I said, the experience of, of the of the developer is very relevant. Uh, have they got skin in the game? That's always a big one for me. So that's how I look at at a, at a deal and like I say I go into that more and actually um Richard very kindly put the link to a webinar follow-up webinar that we did in February um when okay. I was in Malta in the sun uh, that's on that's on the home page there it was on the home page so people can we'll try to it. get a link we'll put a link to it in the description right. but what I wanted to ask you is if people watch that uh, webinar read the article um mm -hmm. has any of that advice uh uh, changed if you like as a result of the changing circumstances that we're going to come out of when we release from lockdown recession all the rest of it I think maybe I've just kind of tightened up on those things a lot more and you know investors or angel investors certainly all speak to each other and that's what I'm hearing from them there's a lot of us a lot of us sat on cash right now and we're actively looking for deals. Does that mean to say we're going to jump into something? No, and I would, I really would urge caution at the moment. Um, but what I, I want to be kind of even more sure 
about what I'm doing. So I will probably take longer to make a decision. I want to be even more sure that, that, that my money is secure. So I'm certainly looking for asset back deals. I want to make sure the legals and the security of the deal is really tight. And also now, I mean, I looked at it before because, because I learned a lesson from somebody else, somebody else's experience. When I look at a developer, I want to know that I have confidence in the deal, but I also want to know that they can run their business as well as the deal because I've seen problems there. They're very different skills. So I have to have confidence that you can keep your business going in order that the deal can get finished. And I think that's even more pertinent right now. You know, you, you kind of that's touched a good on point. buyback loans and, mm. you know, liquidity is, is or may become a problem for people. So I think that's really something to try and establish. That's a good point because, of course, you know, when, when the market's booming, um, the fact that the market's rising masks a few errors, masks a few lack of business skills. And as Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you see he's being, swim, being swimming in the nude. <laughs> that, that has never been more pertinent than right now. And I think we are, I think we are going to see that. Okay. So what stands out? Uh, I mean, what stands out in terms of um, a standout developer? How ex- important is experience and track record in this particular market? I think in this particular market, it, it's more it's more relevant than it was before. It's not to say I wouldn't back a first time developer, and I have, and I do do. But mm-hmm. I but but when I have that, I want to know who's their mentor, who's working with them, who can they go to when a problem comes up. And kind of we were chatting before. Property is a roller coaster. Something is going to go wrong. There's not. There's not. There's a. It, there's a. It's a when, not an if. Um, so I want to know kind of who's there and who can help guide and who can help advise. Um, I, I probably do have a preference for experience. And if somebody has done that type of deal a number of times before, then clearly that's going to give me more confidence that they'll have seen the type of issues that come up and that they can handle it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like experience. Now, a lot of I, I think that shows like Dragon's Den on on TV and such not um, have made a lot of and, and also interest rates are just so low and people are earning nothing on cash. But it's made a lot of people think that they can invest in businesses or invest in property deals. And um, and there's all these crowdfunding platforms and people can uh, sort of invest in equity and debt. But uh, I, I'm not convinced people uh, a lot of people fully understand um, what investing is about. Can you offer, I mean, you've, I know you've worked with people who have had some horror stories and lost money. Can you share some sort of advice for people who are maybe looking to invest their money um, on the due diligence that they should do so they don't lose their share? Absolutely. And was one thing I'm seeing, particularly at the moment, because people are sat on cash and are desperate to, to get that money working, I think there's, there's a lot of, you know, we look for motivated sellers normally well I think there's a lot of motivated buyers and a lot of lot of motivated investors as well at the moment and just because you have money doesn't mean doesn't make you an investor um I I, I my pet bugbear for investors angel investors any investors in general is that there isn't a real understanding of risk and I would really urge people to go away and kind of look at risk just because you know you're risk averse or you're a risk taker that that's not an understanding of risk that doesn't mean you understand how risk is priced. So I would really urge kind of a lot of reading up on that. And there's some fabulous, um, lots of free information on that. Um, I think, you know, the way I did it, I, I actually use crowdfunding. I still use crowdfunding. The way I use it, it is to kind of test out a developer almost. I'll put a small, relatively small amount in, in a deal see how the developer does with, you know, with that amount. Do they say what they'll do? Do they deliver mm-hmm. it in the time frame? How do they handle kind of this roller coaster when something or something does go wrong? And if that goes well, then I will look at kind of scaling up or doing something direct with them. So I actually like crowdfunding. I think you have to be very careful about which platform you use and, and make sure that they do great, do great bank grade due diligence on their projects but I think that's a good way to get into it tentatively and and in a small way and you know everybody anybody who's anybody in investment talks about diversification 
And I do that in a number of ways, but one of the ways I do that is, is, is by doing kind of small amounts and lots of different things, test things out and take your time, test it small. If it works well, go bigger next time, build up. But just yes. take yeah. your time, I think. Not go full on with, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. No, I get you. Um, a lot of people... Uh, just get that all wrong, really. Um, what about uh, the? Uh, what I wanted to ask you as well is how your um, investments or your entrepreneurs actually come to you. Do you, um, if someone has has got a high profile social media and all of that, and they're asking for investors, are you going for those folks, or are they coming to you? How how do they come to your door? That that's that's not my cup of tea, generally. In fact, that that has me running for the hills in that article in January, I think <laughs> I say, the kind of higher the profile, the more all over social media they are, the, the quicker I run away. Um, just because from experience, I've seen that when people get too overly, and it's a balance, right? I will caveat there's a balance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there, there is a few people that do it really well. One of the kind of founders of Property System, which I'm kind of really big in, Ruth and Gillian Hobbs, they manage yeah, it really well. Yeah, they're well. award winners. They, they, were, they won they the awards, of course, last year, but gone. And they manage it really, really well. Um, but when I see somebody concentrating too much on brand, and, and, and I know we've got to do that. I know that's the world we live in now. But when there's so much emphasis on brand and and about the person rather than the business or the project, that worries me because... I see attention being deflected that way, and and I wonder who's actually delivering my project. Oh, I see. Yeah, I w- I wonder about that because if they're on a holiday all the time, then uh, one uh, who's doing the project, and uh, yeah. if they're driving around in the fancy car, then uh, where's the money actually gone? Is that what you're saying, basically? <laughs> More or less, yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people are taught. They go on seminars and stuff, and they're taught to raise their profile. Social media is it to uh, post everything about what you have for lunch and all this sort of stuff. Where's the balance? How, how do people actually get in front of you then if they don't have some sort of profile and they don't tell people what they're doing? I have to tell you, <clears throat> and I'll let you into my secret. Most of the developers I invest with, you've probably never heard of. Okay. And that's the people that keep getting reinvestment from me because they're out there doing it, delivering, doing what they say they will do. Normally, not always, obviously it's property, in the time that they say they will do it, and they do right by me at the end of the day. So So have they come to you then? So is um, it that you've put the profile out there and they're coming to you and then you sift through them? I mean, you know, having been, having now slated social media, I'm a lot more on social media these days because I'm, I'm here in my parents' spare bedroom with not much else to do. Um, so, yeah, I am getting more stuff direct. But I've been out there walking those pavements, going to those, ne- those networking um, events, having those coffees, chatting to anybody who's anybody or who's, you know, nobody, anybody to do my due diligence over the past, what, four or five years that I've been doing this. So I've put in those coffees like so many kind of other investors and angel investors have done, and those seeds are coming to fruition now. Okay, so just to, um, I just want to ask you a a question about um, some sort of investments that I see. I see a lot of people offering, well, some people offering very high returns, you know, 15, 16, 20% even. Um, what advice would you give or what sort of do you do what should people look for if if they see an unusually high return or is that not unusually high it's appropriate and this is where I come back to like exactly what I said understand your risk and what risk that is an appropriate price for in my mind that's an appropriate risk for a second charge investment yes so yes. I'm already knowing kind of what security to expect. It's very high if you have a first charge, but good God, if you can get it, take it. But what's the security on that deal? Like just a PG um, and a loan agreement. I know and my developer friends hate me saying this. It just doesn't work for me. So a PG, of course, is a personal guarantee. And um, how, how valuable is that? you try you try implementing one when nobody's got any assets <laughs> it's you know good luck with that and and unfortunately and, and I am kind of you know anal about this 
because I'm trying to help people out of those yeah. situations at the moment. And yes, there are steps you can take, but good God, make your life easy for yourself and have something that you can claim on. If my developers don't take, take me back, I've got the first charge and yeah, that's no fun to go down that process either, but at least there's an asset that I can chase effectively. There's got to be an asset there. And I think you know, you're right. First charge is, is very, very important. I think the thing that people miss with, with, personal guarantees is that someone that gives a personal guarantee you don't know how many they've issued and to what total value and often the total value of all the personal guarantees they've issued is much more than they've actually got and that's that's exactly the point man jan like that there's no central database of this you know you're relying on the trust and the integrity of that person to be honest with you you're relying on i always get an that statement of assets and liabilities from my um, developers as well which should come from their accountant yes. but maybe that's you know not you no know, you have to rely on somebody else for that as well but but a pg on its own exactly you don't know if all those pgs issued uh, equate to more than than the assets that that, that somebody's got uh, I'm uh, struggling here. I've got a comment here from Ron Schillingford. Uh, the businesswoman, meaning your good self, uh, has such an amazing erudite, E-R-U-D-I-T-E. That's a good word, is it? That's I a think compliment. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what that means. But erudite grasp of investment. She's brilliant. Love her instincts. Oh, that's so we've had some uh, very, very, very good uh, comments there from Ron. Brilliant. Listen, thanks very much. More from Helen very, very shortly. Uh, great insights. Um, now, Susanna, Susanna Cole uh, is a very accomplished uh, residential property investor from Bristol. I've known uh, Susanna for uh, more than 15 years. I don't, I can't, don't exactly remember when we first uh, 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 met. Um, but she, in that time, she's built quite a big portfolio. She, she um, has raised quite a bit of money from private investors and um, knows a lot about the process. So she's kind of coming at it from the uh, other side. Uh, Susanna, are you here? Yes, I'm with you. Oh, brilliant. Good to see you again. Um, so you do a lot of um, JVs and the like. Um, uh, just tell us a little bit about the format uh, the JVs you do actually take. Sure. Oh, no, in fact, before I do that, because I've known Susanna for 15 years, I just forgot that some of you guys might not know Susanna. <laughs> Susanna, sorry, please introduce yourself to our viewers. <laughs> so I'm sat here in Bristol in lockdown. So hi, everybody. Um, and uh, I started in property, yeah, uh, pretty much when you and I met. Uh, and I started by all, my whole intention was simply to buy a small portfolio for myself so that my family was safe. And the uh, six month rule, which is not really a rule, it's more suggestion came in within six months <laughs> of me starting. Like, uh, and so for me, I'd taken 60 grand out of my mortgage. And my intention was just to buy, refinance and go again, which meant I could only do a couple of years and I just wasn't prepared to go at that slow pace. So as a result, the, the workaround, because when legislation or when anything's thrown at you, you, you yes. just got to figure out your hurdle, haven't you? You're like, all oh, right, let's start hurdling, you know. And and really it was, uh, well, let's go to looking at raising private finance. And, and I'd been in charge of a department that raised private finance for a charity uh, and, and watched some highly skilled people in my department, not me, by the way, but those people. So I'd I'd gone to you know conferences of of, of the Association of Fundraisers and, and watched very skilled people do it. And I thought this these proper technical skills can be applicable in property. Um, so as a result, I went up and I raised six hundred grand in less than fourteen weeks. Built a larger portfolio. Jumped out my day job because I think money is not actually the impediment. It's actually time. So mm -hmm. you can raise the resource of money responsibly. And actually, Helen, so much of what Helen was saying, I was like, absolutely, just the same from the other side of the fence. Then you can actually run your business full time. And that's when you're really going to get Because, um, of course, you know, from the developer uh, developer's perspective, uh, money is the fuel, the fuel that fuels your business. Uh, otherwise, it's not actually possible. So what formats do your JVs actually take, your joint ventures take? I stay very simple. Uh, same format for everybody so there's no favoritism and uh, and this is why you'll see there are so many resonances from what Helen was saying from her side of the fence that that I was absolutely going totally agree with so I I do one investor one property mm -hmm. and typically I won't buy the property because I like JVs so joint ventures 
which are flips. So they are repeatable items, but again, just like Helen, start with a small one, see how the, the JV partner behaves, you, you know, see how you deliver as well. They're testing you, you're testing them. Is this relationship gonna work? The JV partner buys it, so I don't need to buy it. So it's in their name. I have a restriction on it, so they cannot, and I've had a couple of people try and be naughty, of course, um, so they cannot sell it from underneath me, you know, without giving me my profit. And then the JV partner does the funding for the refurb. And again, I've had a couple of people, but not many. Um, and so as a result, I learned to get fixed price contract from the builders and I would take the funding in for the renovation before starting. Cause I have had a couple of people go, oh, I've run out of money. Really? <laughs> Interesting. That's not part of the agreement. Um, and so it's always, for me, JVs typically will be in the investor's name. And then when they get flipped up, then we invoice in. But interesting, and all costs are 50-50, apart mm -hmm. from, and this is a, quite an interesting point, that their job is to bring the money, whereas my job is to source the deal, uh, find the team, renovate the property, get it re renovated, and I own the posing kit, which is it, it, interesting. In, in a recession, the posing kit is more expensive. In a high market, the posing kit is What cheap. do you mean? Oh, you mean staging? Staging kit, oh, yes. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I do not uh, split the interest cost 50-50 because my partners can come in with cash or they can come in with bridging or they come in with mortgage, although if you're flipping, it's better to come in with a bridging or cash because that's their only job. Because if I was to split the interest 50-50, then I mean this with total kindness, you know, what use is the partner? They're actually just a funding mechanism and really I could have more or less got that funding myself. You know. So is that just for flipping projects then that yes. you're talking about uh, yeah. turning? By the way, you've got some fans as well. Um, Ali is saying, um, I always watch uh, Susanna's videos she did in Spain. She, he watches them uh, all the time. Big fan of those. Uh, Susanna is another uh, YouTuber. I'll put a link to her channel. Check it out. She does uh, does does property vids as well. Um, but uh, no, okay. The fundraising triangle. I've heard you talk a little bit about that. What's that all about? So that is really recognizing because everybody wants the big investors, you know, the Helens of this world. Hey, Helen, can you come and fund all of my property? You know, everybody wants that. But the reality is mm -hmm. when you go out looking for fundraising uh, partners who, who are the investing partners, you'll get a triangle. Yeah. Up at the top are the larger people. Typically, they'll have pe been people who've either done extremely well through corporate or done management buyouts, built their own businesses and sold them. So typically they'll have kind of five, six million quid plus, And certainly those are the investors at the tip of the fundraising triangle for me. And typically what they look to do is they split their pot up five which ways. So again, do you see the same thing as Helen was saying? And they'll invest one fifth. And what's fascinating for those guys, they'll, they'll, they'll then almost ask you your opinion on the other four fifths. So you get an amazing education in investing whilst only ever receiving one fifth, which is fine. And I had um, one of my uh, main funders used to fund me 600 grand every year. And he'd be like, could you please hurry up uh, and buy more? <laughs> and I actually bought those houses of 100% private mortgages. So they were not JVs buy to sell. He gave me 100% private mortgage and I refinanced and paid him back. But he had first charge on the property and then um, a second or floating charge on other properties of mine. So again, do you see it corresponds to Helen's points? Then you've got, so that they're like 100, 150 grand and above um, that they're going to fund you. And some of my girls were sort of 600 grand. Then you've got the middle section, you know, maybe 50 to 100 grand. So mm -hmm. you can use that kind of money to um, always stay on the right side of the law. Uh, so you can use that kind of money potentially for renovation cost, development cost, or, and there are certain challenger banks that uh, will, uh, as long as they do the money laundering checks on your investor and your investor does not have a charge on the actual property that mm -hmm. they're lending the money on, you can use that as a deposit, but your investor then has to have a charge on a different property. So I've done that repeatedly, whereby the investor pulls in a like 50 to 100, it's a deposit. It is actually used as a deposit on a property, but they have their money secured elsewhere. And the bank has done all the proper due diligence. The investor's been declared. It's all above board. And there's like three or four page certification. How did you go on? Oh, sorry. The, just the 10 to 20 to 30 granders. And that's... It, it, I've I've not I've not said no to those people. I mean, I had one lady give me three grand when I first started. And a year later, I went back and gave her a check back with interest. And she poured me a gin and tonic and she went, I've got a problem. I was like, what's that? She said, well, I've got 30 grand. Would it would it work? I was like, uh, yes, please. <laughs> yes. So a triangle. Big, yes. Small. 
so it, it basically people bubble the way through as the yeah. as the relationship progresses um you mentioned flipping i've had a couple of questions do you think flipping is um a strategy which is going to work as we come out of lockdown yes um do you see how definite i am about that but you yeah, know i want you to tell us why you know, I agree with you, and I know and I know it's happening, but I want you to tell me. <laughs> um, so, uh, profit is a function of speed and price, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. In, in, you know, in, in a rising market, I mean, uh, you know, f first weekend of the market, you're getting loads of offers. Go for yeah. it. You know, brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so, th my posing kit there is IKEA. It's you know, Marks and Spencers. It's 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 middle of the range stuff. Later on in a recession, and I got the house per square foot on a two-bed flat in the last recession of that year, according to the, the estate agent, um, you, you need to build in time. So I, you, you need to know your statistics. Again, do you see how the, even on the other side of the coin, it's the same as Helen? You need to know your maths. You need to know your stats. <laughs> so I knew on average to the number of viewers before you got an offer on that particular flat on average in the recession was 17. I happened to have to wait for 21 viewers before I got an offer. So I priced in the time. And so one of the things I did was A, you buy it cheaper, B, you make sure your renovation is on point as much as you can within the speed bumps that property throws to you. C, you know, you buy it on the Friday and your men are in on the Saturday or the Monday. And then D, your posing kit or um, um, display kit is a much higher quality. So. 80 quid, 100 quid, 150 quid lampshades as opposed to 225 from Ikea. Now, you don't leave them and your furniture is twice the price. And it's, mm -hmm. it's branded, so it's part of the seven Ps and it's about positioning and packaging up that project. You're still leaving white walls, beige carpet, but you are indicating a higher value through the furniture. So you're commanding a higher value. So in a rising market, I tend to go 500 quid, 250 quid cheaper than the house next door. I want it sold immediately. In a dropping or a recessionary market, I will pose it up for value and I will go quite high price. And in the, I mean, in the sort of markets of uh, like the recessionary market we're coming into, I know um, in, in the sort of London area and the southeast, uh, there's always a market for starter homes. Um, first time buyers and people at a transition point in life. So uh, a lot of people, it, it, there's no reason why in a recession, people want to move from a four bed to a five bed. You can hold that off, but people will get their first home and people will move out of a one bed to a two bed because they're having a kid on the way. Um, but four to a five bed, three to a four bed can wait. Uh, have you found that sort of thing? It's best to focus on those properties which are at a key transition point of life stages. Yeah, and also for me, I would focus on cookie cutters, stuff that you can do again and again and again. So you're not doing the top end multi-million pound projects that are bespoke. Um, <laughs> but people, when they feel very wealthy, they, they feel like, you know, the air beneath their wings is just going to float them up to sky financially so they can afford to dash out an extra 100 grand anytime soon. I focus on the steady, eddy, middle of the road stuff. Yeah, so kind of three beds and below in a recession. And also, have you noticed the other trend that's happening is people are now moving on average, I think every 14 years, and they're going up into the loft. So those big five bed houses are gonna be dropping down in value because that ladder is not going up. Um, yes, I yes, very good point. And then grandparents. Um, it's the, the bank of mum and dad and it's the grandpa the bank of the grandparents going down to first-time buyers so there's also a trend where first-time buyers are actually going you know <laughs> this is where I go like millennials <laughs> because I I was the kind of you know when I bought my first house you know you were peeling off that wallpaper and it's scraping into your fingernails you know that knackered old house well these guys people in their late 20s they want the really lovely house at the beginning so the bank of mum and dad or the bank of the grandparents give a much higher deposit and they go higher level straight away. So they might not mm -hmm. go into one bed straight away, they might go into two or three bed, which is really interesting. So it's got to be Instagram ready, even for... <laughs> Instagram yeah. ready. It's got to be. That's a very uh, interesting phrase. Now, what, I mean, over the years, of course, um, there's, there's a lot of... Um, um, regulatory compliance issues to do with raising monies, money as uh, when, when you're a developer and you're looking to raise money from private investors and all of that. Can you just talk us through um, some of the key points, if you like, that people should be aware of? I'm pretty much in agreement with them. So in, was it 1st of January, wasn't it? 2014, mm -hmm. ES13 forward slash three came in. 
And I really agree with that because of an experience I had. So that really said that um, a joint venture, so if, if say Ranjan, you lent me money, we will agree an interest rate. You have to these, day, these days be a high net worth or sophisticated investor and I have to certify you as such, okay? But you still know theoretically, as long as I pay you back, how much money you're gonna get back. You know, <laughs> black and white and you should have taken, well, we should have done the proper legal documentation with proper uh, uh, charges on assets. However, a joint venture is, is, for me, it's a buy to sell. So it's no longer all the responsibility sat on my shoulders to pay you back. It's the, you know, if we did a joint venture on this glass of water, it's when this glass of water sells that we both get paid. So yeah, that's yeah. inherently more risky for the investor yeah. because who's going to buy the glass of water? You know, I'm not in charge of that anymore. Whereas when I was borrowing money from low, because I do, I do both. I do joint ventures and private loans. Yes. When I do loans, I back it up with two or three other income streams to make sure that I've got backup. But a joint venture, it's all about who's going to buy the glass of water. You know, I'm not going to back it up with something else because we're both taking a risk. Therefore, joint ventures are inherently more risky. Yeah. And therefore, PS 13.3, it's 28 pages. You'll have to read it a few times, people, if you've never read it before. Massive four-piece Kit Kat. Um, and there are three ways that your investor needs to be qualified, or one of three ways. The first is that they're a high net worth individual. Mm -hmm. And again, I again, do you see the parallels? I take um, um, asset uh, statements from investors. I want to see their assets. I want to see the latest mortgage statement. I want to look it up on land registry to make sure that you know there's no other charges on it. And if it's jointly owned, I want to know the ownership structure. If not, I can't attribute their asset value to, to them. You know, a brother and a sister, for example, is one example we had. So they need to have either 100 grand um, money uh, income coming in or quarter of a million pound assets, not their own family home insurance or pension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or they can buy a limited company or the third one and i'm no dummy is a is um was a sophisticated investor and i have to tell you i read the documentation so often and in the end i thought do i understand it so i could sit in front of a judge and i thought no so i'm just going to go for the high net worth individual or in a limited company but even in a limited company i'm not, i don't see that as a workaround i want the person to have the appetite to be able to understand the risks yes at, so it's the same due diligence on the other side. And, and, and can this person understand that property, she's a little monkey, she'll bat you just at the wrong moment. You know, hey, we're all in a global pandemic. You know, so <laughs> some of my guys just got a JV through, and uh, you know, I sold myself a plot of land for 75 grand about five weeks ago in the middle of a global pandemic. But, but can the person actually navigate the risk? So that's why I agree that something like <coughs> Is really useful. Oh, <laughs> Someone's just Billy Street, Ranjan rocks. It just made me... <laughs> it's time for the dance, oh. Ranjan. <laughs> I've uh, got plenty of fan messages for you. You've you've outfanned me about four to one, <laughs> Susanna. So I just got the one. And I just take it. Oh, it wasn't as good as I like posh birds. <laughs> <laughs> they, they can read that on the replay. Uh, Susanna, so tell me, uh, crowdfunding. <laughs> crowd, crowd, he's put me off. This guy, crowdfunding. Um, what's your take on um, using crowdfunding to raise uh, uh, f funds? Interestingly, it's something I've never done. I've observed it with a lot of interest. Um, mm. I I like one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, I like uh, the soft stuff that comes as well as the cash, if you see what I mean, in the relationship. So the, the, there are two types of investors that, that I work with. One will be people who've earned a lot of money through their corporate career, and the other one will be entrepreneurs who probably sold their companies or done management buyouts and then sold their companies. And the skills that those guys and women have is astonishing. So I like doing a one-on-one -on -one relationship. They've done their due diligence on me. I've done my due diligence on them. We've built the relationship. We do repeatable relationships. And they come in. I can see you trying not to laugh, but they come in. And whilst they're going to benefit financially from, you know, the, the asset that's going to sell at a profit, they're also very interested in entrepreneurialism and um, they're, they're very glad to not be working at the pace that I'm working at, but they're also very, very helpful in being more experienced entrepreneurs than me as, as I grow my business. So 
I, I like the one-on-one -on -one relationship because I think that's a relationship that could be navigated well and when things get difficult, which inevitably sometimes it does in property, you can generally, not always, have a partnership approach to problems. Yes, no, I think those are those are those are fabulous points. This is Susanna. It's always a delight to chat to you. I know when we chat on the phone, we're always on for hours. So it's always uh, uh, entertaining and informative. Uh, we'll come back later on when we when we have a little bit of a group uh, chat. But I've got to bring our uh, token uh, bloke uh, uh, on the panel uh, in on the discussion. Evan, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. How are you doing, Evan? <laughs> I'm good, really enjoying the comments. Very amusing. <laughs> so Evan is a developer. Oh, it's great fun, isn't it? Looking at the comments. You're you're entertaining all of us, including us, uh, not, our speakers sure, and all of that. I'm not sure whether Leon wants Helen or, or Susanna as a mentor. Well, they're all, they're, I mean, both Helen and uh, Susanna have got um, an incredible fan base. I think they've encouraged all their fans to come on here. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing. <laughs> A lot of people uh, saying um, uh, all sorts of stuff. Right now, um, Evan, you are a developer, and uh, it, you know. Um, so, what sort of developments do you do? The odd loft conversion here and there, or uh... I've done a loft conversion, but it was about twenty years ago. Um, so, no, at the moment we're doing um, uh, a development in, in Oval in Kennington. It's about a hundred thousand square foot mixed use development, apart hotel led. We've actually just agreed a deal on a 135 unit site in the Cotswolds. We're mm -hmm. building out a 19 unit scheme in Gloucester at the moment, as well as a 12 unit build to rent scheme in, elsewhere in Gloucestershire. Um, and we finished a, a six unit mm -hmm. um, scheme of, of upmarket flats in Hyde and Kent last year. So it's a bit of a flavor of some of the stuff we do. Yes, I mean, I'm, I said that flippantly, of course. Evan's a very accomplished developer. He's got more than 100 million um pound of gdv um value of his developments that are currently uh, in the pipeline does some serious stuff he's also a fantastic wine connoisseur if you ever uh, go out for dinner with evan make sure he chooses the wine because he, it's, it's all his fabulous stuff um so tell us about wine no uh well, that's for another time <laughs> now development financing is interesting isn't it because um you typically get financing for a short period of time and uh, it's time limited. You know, I mean, whereas a mortgage often is 25, 35 years. And if you're in the middle of a development finance, sorry, if you're in the middle of a, middle of a development uh, project and we have um, this COVID-19 stuff and everything stops, it creates a little challenge if you've got short term financing. Um, do you have any views on how it's affected yourself or other people in this in this industry and how they're coping with it? Yeah, so no, you're right. Development finance is project finance. It's time limited. It's generally 18 months, two years, unless you've got a really big, big project, it can be longer. And so something like COVID will have a big impact on um, whether or not you're going to be able to finish a project within the the, um, the timescales that you've got for the facility. Actually, um, we're in the middle of two developments at the moment, and uh, both lenders have been understanding one more so than the other. One's been very relaxed actually. Um, and so when lockdowns or just after lockdown started, we had a bit of a chat to them to say, well, what, you know, how's this going to work? And they essentially said, we understand what's going on. Um, we will um, review things once we're out of lockdown, uh -huh. but um, in principle, we're agreeing to extend all of our development loans for three months because we recognize that that you're all potentially longer if needed because we recognize that um, you're not going to be able to finish the project without that. So I think these are these are um, exceptional times. These are circumstances which nobody can avoid. And um, I think that review with the development lender will include not only um, how long we need it to extend the facility for, but what we need in terms of costs, because there will be an impact on costs. They're not going to start, they're not going to stop charging us interest during the, 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 the period that where you know, we're slowed down. And mm. actually, one of the things about development finance is um, as you go on in a project, it becomes more expensive. So the most mm. expensive part is when you are 90% finished and you can't sell anything. So that is the riskiest bit of the project. So we're not quite at that with either project. With one, we're about probably, I don't know, 30, 40% in. The other one, we're maybe 60, 70% in. But... Um, you know, it is expensive at that point because you've incurred quite a lot of the cost of, of the of the overall development. If it happens when you're, you know, when you've just started, all you've got is a site loan. So, um, you know, it, it's it's really 
it really is um, important what stage you're at. Um, what the government have um, given help, if you like, to uh, residential mortgage holders, buy-to-let mortgage holders with three-month deferments, but they've given nothing to developers. I mean, there's no onus on on bridging lenders or development finance people to give people a, a payment uh, deferment for three months. It's, it's purely up to them. Is that is that what, what you've found? It is a negotiation, absolutely, um, with a lender. And I wouldn't want to be, uh, I wouldn't want to have bridging finance right now, I've got to be honest. Uh, certainly not hot, expensive bridging finance. That would be, um, I mean, I tend to avoid bridging finance anyway. I don't like it. It's too, for me, it's too risky. But um, it is, um, I have used it, but only very occasionally in, in circumstances where I'm really clear about what the exit's going to be. Um, but yeah, it's not, um, it, it, it is, I think most, in general terms, most lenders are are quite understanding. But those who have, um, who take their, their funds from the wholesale market um, have been a bit less understanding. Some, some lenders, some of those lenders, the octopuses and octanes of this world stopped lending because mm. I think they had their own funding issues. Those who get their funds from deposits or are lending their own money are in a, in a slightly different place. So people like BLG and Oak North um, or Downing, for example, Downing sourced their money through P2P. So effectively, they raised they raised their money from individual investors, and they've they've got a very big fund or a very big set of funds. Um, they are taking a much more measured and reasonable approach. Are you finding um, that post COVID nineteen? There is a there is a different appetite for uh, for lending to developers, and is there a flight to experienced developers? And are new new developers finding it hard? There's a whole I'm bunch of questions so there. But... I don't actually know what new developers are experiencing at the moment, but I strongly suspect that they are struggling more than an experienced developer like us would. I'm not having any trouble getting finance at the moment for new projects. Um, but banks are being more conservative. So they've trimmed their loan to GDVs by 5% generally, maybe some mm-hmm. up to 10%. So if they were lending at 60% loan to gross development value, they might be lending at 55% now. Um, but with that said, the, 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 the market, the view on the market is not as negative as you might assume. Um, I think as we were going into COVID, the market was starting to take off again, particularly in London. We'd had a flat two or three years in London. And so, Actually, the market was showing, showing some very strong signs of life. And, and actually, what's happened is that the market's been suppressed. Uh, we don't have a liquidity crisis like we had in, in, two, in 2008, 2009. It's not the same sort of crisis as the global financial crisis. Mm-hmm. And if anything, because of the government's measures, we've got, we've got excessive liquidity. There's a lot of, there was a lot of money kicking, down, kicking around as we went into lockdown. And there's even more now. Um, so I yes. think it's likely that as we exit from lockdown, we'll see... And that, that suppression of activity lifts, we'll actually see a, a bit of a burst of activity. Um, that is a very good point, because uh, before, in the last credit crunch, there was a liquidity crisis, but there's tons of money, but they are going to be cautious. You mentioned they've dropped uh, LTVs a little bit, um, but how are they looking at the actual development costs, um, labour, materials, that that whole thing, and the time it's taken? Are they... Are they, are they um, um, assessing those in a different way post COVID, uh, I wouldn't say significantly. The, the 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 issue at the moment is actually getting things and getting people to do things. Mm-hmm. So um, one of the issues that we've had on on our developments is actually that one of the contractors, for example, has just just not turned up because they've furloughed all their staff or they've got people who are ill. So we had, we had an issue with our electrical contractor, and that stopped us getting on with other things. We had some issues with supply of a, of a floor, a block and beam floor, on one of our other developments, and it just held us up. So one thing with development, one thing holds up another thing. And so it will slow you down. But I mean, strangely, you know, things are not more expensive. It's just a question of getting someone who can do things. And actually, there's more people around looking for work because, um, well, they have, they have been because um, the PLC house builders basically stopped building. They're starting to ramp up again. And um, some interesting feedback, actually, from, from the PLC house builders in terms of demand is, is that firstly, they've all sold houses during lockdown. I know Linden Homes sold something like 150 homes during lockdown, and that's about half of what they normally do. Um, but the early indications are that they're getting, they're getting a lot of interest mm-hmm. as um, marketing starts to reopen. I mean, the issues, there yes. are issues around showing people around houses, doing show home launches, those sorts of things. You can't put people together in, 
in small spaces. So we've got to be creative about how we deal with that stuff. Well, we we had one development going and we just finished a week before lockdown, a commercial um, serviced office thing. I'm glad that we finished it just before lockdown. But one thing I was wondering was that if you've got development projects within um, lockdown and they are funded um, by through development finance, um, the bank or the lender releases funding in stages and they have to send a, val- uh, a, a QS or someone to come around and do a uh, valuation statement. But the thing is, uh, Rick said they were all in lockdown and they weren't sending people out. So how were those sort of issues tackled or are being tackled? Um, well, they are doing virtual um, visits. So oh, really? on one of our sites, rather than the, the surveyor actually visiting in person, we just sent him a load of photos and videos. And then we walked around with a WhatsApp video and showed him around the site and talked him through mm-hmm. what was happening. He didn't actually have to, have to physically visit. And quite honestly, it's probably the way that, 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 that those things will be done more frequently in future because people realize it's really not such a problem <laughs> to be able to, you know, to, do a, to do a monitoring surveyor's report that way. Did they We've reduce their had, fee? No. <laughs> charge the bank and then the bank charge it back to us. Yeah. But, but um, and actually what's funny is that on one of those sites, the bank is actually wanting more regular monitoring because of their concerns about projects during COVID. They're actually asking us for, for bi-weekly updates, which is quite annoying, but um, mm-hmm. they're really, you know, that that's Hampshire Trust Bank actually. Um, the other lender is just, is just not worried. Um, so they're, they're much more relaxed and ironically that's a much bigger project so I think you know as, as Helen said uh, banks are very similar to investors um, they're investing in you as an individual um, you know the project as well but they are investing in your ability to deliver it and I think if they if they are comfortable with you as an individual and happy with what you're doing they'll just leave you alone to get on with it yes 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 okay listen Evan thanks very much and um, I what, what we're going to do now is just uh um, have a bit of a discussion among the four of us to find out, uh, really take the subject forward on funding. As I mentioned, if you got if you put in a super chat and you want to ask a question and you want to interrupt straight away, we'll kind of put your question directly uh, to these guys. I had a super chat earlier, actually, from... Um, hang on a minute. Where is it again? Um, Khalid. Um, who is on asking? Um, being a first-time investor... In these times, uh, what's the best route to take? Flip, buy to let, HMO, or anything else? I guess that was asked during Susanna's uh, uh, talk. So, Susanna, would you like to kind of give your uh, two pennies worth on that one? So, I have single let, student let, HMOs, and service accommodation. Um, we shut down my entire service accommodation portfolio and put it out to single lets uh, a week before lockdown. So we will get a huge boost again. So at the moment, you can't really do service accommodation. Um, Students, all of my students are fine. So if you're going to do HMOs, I would move you towards a student portfolio at the moment, but you've got to look at the risk. What's happening with your local university? Are they going to get all the students coming in next year? Are they going to be dropping prices and absorb all the students? So we have had every student, because we already sold our student properties for September last January. We did let people out of their contracts if they wanted to come out. I only had one group of students come out of their contract. The only, now normally I love HMOs, you make a thousand, well, I make over a thousand pound per property. HMOs in lockdown was the only place where for the first time ever I had some voids in my portfolio because it wasn't safe to put people into a mixed household. Mm. It's allowed now, but I'd just be more wary of that at, uh, uh, at this stage. And if you are going to do HMOs, I would definitely do top end where you're charging top end prices and doing um, en suites with a Jack and Jill bathroom because of the VOA, the valuation office thing. So, and but the other thing I would say as a first time investor, always give yourself options, never back yourself into a corner. So if you're going to do either a student let, a single let, or an HMO, um, make sure it's a 10% yield and above. And for an HMO, it should be like 17 to 23%, but also make sure it's quite a 20% markup for a flip. So if either the market doesn't help you or you change your mind, you can flip it or rent it and you're happy either way. So uh, let's um, uh, ask for a few predictions then from you guys. Um, where do you think we'll be in a year's time? I mean, it's all going to uh, change a little bit uh, when we come out of lockdown. But how? I mean, Helen, what do you think? What, what do you, What do you think? Where do you think we'll be in a year? 
property market wise. I'm afraid I'm always the the doom and gloom merchant. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm like, I, I would prefer to know, on, and it's something I always ask my developers, what's the worst case that can happen? If I'm prepared for the worst case and with surprises on the upside, then happy days. So, you know, I, I, I do actually know, I was chatting with Ruth today, actually, and saying, she says some some um, property prices are, are going up. If we're talking about the, the, the um, house market, so prices are going up. So I think you might see kind of short term kind of, uh, you know, people ready to deploy cash and a, and a little kind of spike. But I'm I'm concerned that for the economy in general, we haven't really seen the shocks and the, the disruption to the supply, supply chain kind of kind of hit yet. I think that's going to start happening in three months time. And, and, and I am worried about about that. So I think there's better opportunities. I mean, the good side, the good spin on that is there's going to be lots of opportunity. But a year's time, I think we'll be struggling still in house prices and the economy, personally. I mean, Evan, you've got some development projects up and uh, uh, sort of coming to fruition. When the market goes into recession, sometimes um, new build um, sale prices become severely challenged. Uh, is that a concern to you? The new build market is supported very strongly at the moment by help to buy. Hmm. I think people still want to buy new houses. People still want to move. Um, it is supported by sentiment to a large extent. Um, but I think one of the things that is, uh, is, is pretty much constant with economics is that if you pump money into an economy, it causes a flat inflation. Yeah. And there's an enormous amount of money being pumped into the economy at the moment. So that is going to cause asset prices to increase one way or another. Um, an increase in asset prices is always inevitably followed by a crash. The question is when. Um, and Helen is right in, in highlighting the risk that a high level of employment could potentially cause the market to, to tail off. But I, say, I think in the short term, at least, and when I say the short term, I mean the next one to two years, we're likely to see asset prices rise. I think what will drive things beyond then is how well we recover from COVID and how quickly we we recover from from COVID. In other words, you know how how quickly do we get back to normal? How quickly quickly do we pick employment back up again from you know the, the points that we are the point that we are at the moment where everyone who I mean everyone who is furloughed is basically unemployed. That's you know they're just, they're just getting paid eighty percent of what they normally get paid. When we had the two thousand and nine thing, um, what I noticed because I I kind of filled my boots with property in two thousand nine to two thousand and fourteen really, but as soon as the job market began to pick up again, then what happened was the effects of the quantitative easing started to create the asset bubble. Yeah. So, and these guys have pumped in three times more money already into the economy than they did after the two thousand and nine thing. So, really, as soon as the job market begins to bounce back which might take a year 18 months who knows but then there's all that potential asset bubble to come well i think so and and actually you know we've got a combination of really interesting factors historically low interest rates they could be negative soon um i think the the sentiment is not negative out there people mm -hmm. feel negative when they can't afford things the banks are still lending right so another thing that strongly drives acquisition of properties is ability to get finance Yes, some buy lenders pull out of the market um, at the early stages of lockdown, but they've come back in again. LTVs are going back up again. There isn't a problem with owner-occupier mortgages. There definitely isn't a problem with held by mortgages. So um, I don't. I think the the, the short term short term outlook for new home for new homes is relatively good, but but it's it's going to be critically important to have help to buy it, and it it, it has been many developments that are selling eighty percent of their properties using help help to buy. I mean, that's the crutch that's holding the market up. Yes, that's that's very, very true this time. And that wasn't available last time. So, OK, you guys have all heard heard each other talk. Um, what questions do you have for any of us, really? Who wants to kick us off? Helen, Susanna, Evan? Questions for each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've heard, we've all heard each other talk. I'm asking the questions. I just wondered whether you guys have had any comments on each other's uh, talks or opinions as we've expressed them. So Evan, buy to sell or buy to keep in the next three years? For me, it will be uh, exactly to 2009 to 2014, I completely bought and 
and things doubled and tripled in value since. But what would you do, buy to sell or buy to keep in the next few years, given that as an animal, you're more a developer than a keeper, my understanding is? Um, my business is property development and investment. So right. I do both. So, um, where, so I'm, where I'm, I'm, investors, I'm an investor as well as a developer. So I've got a portfolio of about 50 investment properties. So yes. I will always keep some and right. I will always sell some. And I'll tend to keep the stuff which has a higher yield. And I sell the stuff that has a lower yield just simply because um, it helps me free up more capital. And would you be tempted to keep more now? I, I would, if I was you at the moment, as whatever proportion you normally keep out of the whole 100%, I'd be kind of wanting to gear that up myself now, cash flow permitting. I, I have enough. I don't really need any more. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I will sell whatever sells easily and anything that doesn't, I'll just refinance and keep at the end. That's always pretty much been my, my model. It's, it's about being able to move on quickly. And what you inevitably get with a development is you get three or four that don't sell at the end. What I almost always do is just refinance them out, put them into, in, into the investment property portfolio and just move on. Yeah. So it's about, for me, it's about keeping moving. Um, I'm yeah. not really, and, and I'm thinking in 10 year, 20 year time scales, not, you know, yeah. I'm not trying to trade. Yes. Gotcha. So um, where are people going to be putting their money over the next few years? Because I, I see an asset bubble coming at some point and, it's almost as though if you have some cash, there is a potential of that cash being worth less through inflation. So where do you hedge it? Wine? Not, not any of that. Uh, well, wine would be a good place. I would put it in, in, in Grand Cru Burgundy, actually. <laughs> Throughout the global financial crisis. Um, Domaine de Romani Conti. Write that down. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I would if I could spell it. A <laughs> risk. A risk. Eridite, Jan. <laughs> the risk is that you could actually end up paying to have your money in the bank, right? Mm. So if interest rates become negative, then, I mean, what that's a great incentive to get people spending again. And one of the keys to get the economy going, actually, ironically, is to get people spending. Yeah. So if the government can get, because people won't spend if they're not sure about the future. If people get start spending again, the economy will grow, that will bring up employment, and we'll, 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 get, we'll get growth again. And so it could be one of the tools alongside quantitative easing that actually gets the, 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 the economy restarted. OK, listen, I've got to butt in because we've got a super chat question from Akil Mayer. I think this is quite an interesting question, actually. Um, please tell us one thing in the last 12 weeks. Sorry, please tell us one thing the last 12 weeks has taught you and what you're going to be doing um, differently going forward. It's taught me that I can live without going to meetings in London, and I'm actually way more productive um, working from home. And, it, and actually, it, it's also... I'll miss you if you don't come down to London. I know. <laughs> I'll, I will come back. <laughs> but, but you know what? I, I, just, I think it's taught us all how to be a lot more productive. Um, what was that to use Zoom? Uh, say it again? It's taught us how to use Zoom. Well, exactly. I was, we, we were all using it before that, but I think it's forced people who weren't using zoom and other tools <clears throat> that make you more productive to actually learn how to use them and so it means that we're all i think working a lot more productively and, and traveling less i think that's got to be a good thing helen what, what's the last 12 weeks taught you what you're going to be doing differently well aside from a lot more patience and actually how tolerant my parents can be with me i uh, i've learned i can live without 50 pair of shoes which is always good <laughs> Do you know what? It, it, it's taught me that the people that I'm working with currently, I absolutely adore. And I was yeah, chatting with somebody else about this the, the other day. I think this period is really, you really begin to see p people's true colours. Again, I mentioned that in that in that January article. It's not for people's backs against the wall that you really see what they're like. And that's ultimately for me as an angel investor, what I'm trying to ascertain before I get, you know, get into that deal with somebody, how will they behave when things go wrong? And I've seen that kind of, that there's a book called Give and Take that the lovely Claire Norwood recommended to me. And I've seen in this period that the giving people give more and the taking people take more. So I'm pretty happy with the, with the, the um, business partners I've got right now. They, they're coming up trumps. And Susanna, last 12 weeks, what's it taught you and what you're going to be doing differently? Ah, well, that I love entrepreneurialism. Uh, um, uh, I, I think I might have sent you photos. We had to pivot a little bit of one, one mm -hmm. of the businesses. And so I just wrote a new business plan. It's all across. Above yes, yes. America. 
uh, and I'm slowly working my way through it and I'm having a blast. Now, the first week and a half, you know, I have parents in the late 70s. I love them to bits. I was really anxious, um, really nervous. Did a little bit of meditation, calmed the rock down. And actually, it's business as normal, which sounds weird. I've had one bridge, uh, two mortgage offers come through, proper mortgage offers, uh, and then only one uh, property got stuck where I got the valuation and then they pulled out the market. So I'm more or less business as normal, which is fascinating, but pivoting and enjoying things like automation, efficiency, all the stuff Evan was talking about. And I just love being an entrepreneur. I, I, I am like rolling out of bed, excited to go to work, which is from the top of the house to the bottom of the house. Love it. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so, uh, Susanna, what did you... Um... Uh, sort of what were your takeaways from what Helen said and do you have any sort of uh, uh, questions you would like to ask Helen from an angel perspective? Well I thought what was interesting was how frequently I was nodding all of her talk about make sure it's asset-based security make sure you've got legal agreements make sure that it's a relationship make sure you can see how somebody behaves when the back is against the wall none of this marking stuff let's see what really happens you know when things go wrong because we know property work does I thought it was fascinating how much I do the assessment on the same side for the investors. It, it, because we'd done so many uh, um, joint ventures, we ended up having a little um, almost personality sort of assessment form for investors, which assumed that they would have money. And then it was all about how do they behave. And one of the things we assessed, Helen, which was an odd one, was do they behave nicely to my team? Because it's a bit like when you're dating the waiter test. Is he nice to the waiter or is he just nice to you because he wants something, you know? And they're all nice to me because I was theoretically the route to some wealth. And it was, are they nice to my team? And that was actually the number one indicator of whether we'd work with somebody or not. So about character, which is what Helen's talking about. Um, I guess it's just the excitement of what's next for you. Apart from being in lockdown and not yet being able to navigate your way back to Malta, um, how what's next for you in the next 18 months for investing and where do you get excited about it to be honest I, i'm desperate to get back to Malta, so i'm going back get back to my nice quiet life this, this lockdown has been i've been working till 2 a.m in the morning i'd like to get back to the beach really <laughs> um but what it has given me is the opportunity to learn about stuff or, or kind of different strategies if you will that i've not before so um, I've le listened to some really good stuff by Susie Carter and Kirsty Darkins on the commercial side of stuff. It's not something I've done, been exposed to much before. So I'm learning lots about different pockets that I've not had exposure to. And, you know, I am a I'm a tortoise. I'm not a hare. So talk to me in a year's time. and I'll still probably be thinking about it. But it's been great to have that opportunity to learn about that type of stuff. So it's a period of reflection, really, in order to think about another another egg in an, in another nest. So, so yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, I'm I'm so much about diversification, and you know, this kind of shocks you know to to the to the, to the economic and the um, housing system has 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 really kind of focused the mind on. Gosh, you need to be even more diversified if possible. So. And how do we look at that and, and, and where are the opportunities that, that I don't know? I, I say earn your right to risk. I won't go into anything if I don't understand it or have a decent understanding of it. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I've been you know, learning lots about new, new places. I think um, that question was quite illuminating because it really shows um, the kind of people uh, that you guys are. Because, you know, when with a lot of people who have been in lockdown it's it's what what uh, box set they've binged watch on netflix but with you guys with all of us it's it's learning a new game it's learning new stuff it's pivoting our business it's excitement of um of of, of changing adapting to thrive in the coming times and that's a different level of excitement and uh, i think that's a very entrepreneurial trait uh, you know, and, and I kind of echo everything that you guys have said. And I, I think there's a big difference in people who are entrepreneurial and people who are not in the, in the way they use their time to, to learn and step up their game, to do new things, uh, to figure out how, yes, things has changed, are changing, but um, no one's going to sort of 
uh, roll over and accept it and do nothing. We all know that when there's change, there is opportunity. As long as you rise up to the challenge and step up your game. And that's what I'm hearing from all of you guys. It's absolutely true. You know, there's a huge amount of opportunity uh, in this environment, but you just have to think about doing things differently. So it's looking for the silver lining on the cloud. And we have done, we've closed a couple of deals in the last month that we probably wouldn't have done if it wasn't for the current, current environment. People are looking to do things differently. So they're more open to JVs if perhaps they've got something that they can't sell. Or So you just have to think about creative structuring. And I think you can't, you, we, there is, the old normal is not the new normal. The mm-hmm. new normal is how do we adapt and how do we, how do, we do things differently in this new world? I, I, I wouldn't mind just picking up on the point that Helen made about risk, actually. I think this is really important. Um, one of the things for us, when we have investors in our projects, is, is that a, a lot of investors um, don't necessarily understand that relationship between risk and, 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 and security and return. And that's probably one of the most important things when you're looking at investment. What security are you getting? And does the rate of return match the security? If you're getting a really strong security, a first charge, you shouldn't expect 20% return on your investment. You're just not going to get it. If you're putting equity into a project, then you you shouldn't be looking for 5% or 6% return because the security that you're getting doesn't match with the return that you're getting. For equity, you need to be looking at 20% plus. So I think it's a question of matching matching security with return that's very important. And this whole thing about control is, is very interesting as well. We have an investor that we work with that's put 6 million pounds into one of our projects. Um, that, that, that is a small proportion of the overall amount of money that they have, they're a family office. And I can tell you the degree to which they tie us up in knots and in terms of what we can and can't do on that project is extreme. They put themselves in a position where if they wanted to, they could take that control. So really they have us completely under the thumb. Now you can only be in, in that position if you are, you know, if you, if you have um, that sort of money to, to deploy, but um, What's interesting is, is not only do they tie us up to that extent, but they're very experienced and they understand exactly what they're doing. They understand how risk works, probably in some ways better than we do. And they actually help us deliver the project. So they're adding value. It's, it's not just money, it's smart money. And, and I think those, those guys have successfully been in real estate equity investment for 30 years and they really, they really know their stuff. And so, so there are some lessons that you can learn from, from people that you work with. Can I take that from the larger development into the one-on-one residential development? So when I started borrowing money, there was everybody walking around, weren't they, in property events going, hey, I'll give 12%, 1% oh. a month. You're like, what? That's mental. You know, and, and people just do it because everybody else does it. It seems to be the thing, doesn't it? But, uh, uh, and, uh, and I stupidly, and I'm going to use that word, stupidly did the same when I first started because it was like, well, that's what everybody does. I'll be a duck. I'll just walk the duck walk. And then what I realized was, okay, I was quite risky in the early days because I didn't have many assets. But as I grew my asset base every year, and again, reflecting back to Helen, I used to produce an asset base and show my investors, look, this is what I've got. Here's my mortgage statements. This is my asset base now so and every year six months and basically my investors stayed in there's very few people ever wanted out in terms of the private loans and um, about 20 percent of people come out 80 percent stay in so all the work is done in the early days to get those investors in and i used to pay them monthly and it was and six months before the loan was due i would say look i used to pay you this but in six months time i'm dropping it by two percent and the reason mm-hmm. I am much less risky. Let me produce all the information. And I didn't do it, you know, two weeks ahead so that they felt like the arm was up behind their back. Six months in advance. Um, let me give you that information. Let's book a call in two weeks' time and just see how you feel, whether you want to stay in. No one ever came out. From 12% down to 2%. Susanna, I've got a, um, a, a bit of a super chat question for you from LR. Um, do you uh, feel dressing properties is necessary in all areas? Uh, what in in the bathroom in the kitchen? I think they mean geographic areas rather okay. than uh, all areas yeah. of the house. Uh, I have a two bedroom flat in Hastings. I plan to do a flip. Um, and also, uh, what areas do you have your HMOs in? Ah, Bristol, a nine minutes drive from my house. Uh, the couple of the outliers are seventeen minutes, so all within a very very tight uh, circle within Bristol city centre. Um, yes, you're not selling a shed, LR. 
you're selling a house. And also think about your customer because you're not really selling a beautiful dovetail joint. You're selling a hope of love, affection, comfort, food, sex, you know, and warmth, homework, children, whatever you're selling, it's home. That's what you're selling. And who makes that decision in a heterosexual couple? I'm not gonna guess it's the guys generally. Like no. one out of a hundred men will be like, honey, we're living here. 99 out of a hundred will be sweetheart. This is our new home. Okay, so now let's think who are your buyers? They're probably women. Mm -hmm. Helen, you love design and staging. I, well, not staging, but design. I love design. Um, if you, LR, if you go to the high street, it's probably more for women than men, and those windows are dressed beautifully. Why? Because we respond to it. I'm going to suggest another reason as well, which mm -hmm. is um, because folks like Evan will be selling into the first time buyer market with the benefit of help to buy, or should I say help to sell, and the people are uh, coming up with 5% deposit and they will have nicely staged homes too. And if you're flipping, you, you don't benefit from help to sell or help to buy as it's officially called. Uh, so you have to give it a bit of a boost. Yeah. And if you're in the location near Evan, you should definitely, I mean this with kindness, you should go and check out how he does it. Because how an experienced person does it is how you should be doing it. You can replicate that stuff. But so, exactly. Susanna's spot on. Go and see some show homes that developers do. But actually, more importantly, take take notice of what they advertise. Yes. 90% of the advertising doesn't actually have the properties in it. It's got mm. a picture of a family playing together or a couple cooking in the kitchen. Yes. What they're selling is a dream. Yes. And Susanna's spot on in terms of who makes the decision about the house. And it's one of the reasons why kitchens are very important in, in homes and bathrooms. Kitchens and bathrooms sell places, dressing sells places. And it's the women that make the decisions. On the subject of all this gender stuff, a question for you, Evan. Why is it um, us blokes seem to have a massive problem with the COVID-19 haircut and the, the, the ladies seem to be absolutely fine? Are you are you criticising my hair, Ranjan? Well, yeah, it's as bad as mine. you got more of it, but it's still... <laughs> We seem to have a massive problem with COVID-19 hairstyles. <laughs> I thought this was my normal haircut. I don't know. We're going to have to ask Helen and, and Susanna, I guess. <laughs> I'm missing my hairdresser. What's oh, your secret? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, they weren't expecting that question. Anyway, so, um, okay, listen, guys, I think... Um, uh we oh, that's pretty much all we've got uh time for i think you guys have been a fabulous panel giving us some great insights um and you know it's a little bit of property chat and i think it's really nice that you know we get together and share uh, a little bit of our thoughts yeah. from a few different perspectives on the same theme go on susanna question what's next for you because you and i have conversations about you know get together consult <clears throat> investors buy blocks of flats what, it, what are you going to be doing in the next three years based on COVID? Because that is going to be interesting. Well, I'm a big fan of commercial property, and I think the government's brought in so many permitted development rights to allow them to be repurposed very, very easily without the hassle of planning permission. Um, and I think there's a massive oversupply of commercial properties, particularly retail and office, which is now going to be, um, that oversupply has become accelerated because of the shutdown. Uh, the change that was already happening and was taking a few years has kind of shifted up a gear. So over the next couple of years, there are going to be a huge amount of commercial real estate coming um, on uh, for sale. Um, there's not going to be the commercial demand for it. And there's going to be the opportunity to basically, in a market that isn't doing anything, I see the opportunity as taking commercial real estate, which is low priced per square foot, and repurposing it to residential space without going through planning, but getting an immediate uplift, mm. um, even if the market is static, because residential per square foot is usually a lot more than commercial per square foot. And that's just like an immediate opportunity to kind of make a bit of hay when the sun shines. I mean, Evan, you do a bit of commercial. I mean, have you got any views on that um, bit of off the cuff uh, strategizing? Absolutely. Look, I mean, the, 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 the high street was in decline before we went into lockdown. And so what lockdown has done and what coronavirus has done is accelerated a trend that was already underway. People who have started relying on online shopping during lockdown are not going to go back to going. If you going can get a slot, you have to wake up. You have to be up at 12 at midnight, but go on. <laughs> yeah, you can arbitrage a bit between, between providers. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, but 
but people are not going to go back to and, and actually by the way that, those those companies are ramping up their operations significantly and will catch up but um the, and, and in fact in many ways are already catching up but people who have got used to the convenience of online shopping and 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 are not going to go back to wanting to shop in physical shops again so we will still shop but the high street will, will it'll accelerate that decline of the high street and so that opportunity for repurposing buildings not just into residential but also into other uses so one of the one of the markets that we're focused on is hotel and, and a part hotel market mm-hmm. I think it'll create some great opportunities there some of the challenges i mean with with, with resi there can be challenges around around getting consent okay not with pd but there can be challenges about getting consent for resi and town center sites and actually mixed use developments which incorporate more active uses on the ground floor like cafes retail maybe smaller retail um units you know, the, the, the days of 100, 200,000 square foot retail units are over. They're going to be display units. They're going to be 5,000, 10,000 square foot units at the most. Those are, that's where the demand is going to be. And then sitting behind that, you're going to have other uses, things like apart hotels, perhaps co-living. Um, you might have cafe space, gyms. Well, the, well, the cafe would be more the active uses at the front. So you can have active uses on the on the on the facades, and then other uses. When you were talking about active uses, I was sure you meant gyms, but I'm rather refreshed to hear that active uses is cafes because I can handle that sort of active uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 use. I can it's about that. it's about what brings life into the street, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> yes. Actually, Ranjan, that's that's one of the the one of the things I've been doing to to kind of gen up on the commercial side is watching the video that you made with the lovely Kieran Gill. Yes. Kind of that strategy and actually getting more into that and and really understanding kind of how that works and what to look for. So that that's a really good one. I think people should watch that. Thank you. Um, Evan, I'll ask you this question. I've had a bit of a super chat. A uh, question from Ant G, which will probably be our final one of the stream. Um, could there be a potential opportunity to work with councils to establish temporary mobile accommodation with fixed guaranteed rent paid by the council? I mean, I mean in previous um, uh, recessions and everything, some developers uh, have taken an exit of taking their stock and renting them to councils if there's been a problem in selling. I don't know whether the question is related to that, but do you have any views on that? I'm assuming you mean the social housing. Um, yeah. Actually, social housing these days is run by organisations called RSLs, Registered Social Landlords. Uh, and those are generally um, either run, they can actually be run as, as for-profit companies, but generally they're run as not-for-profit companies. So they've got a board of directors, they're funded in some manner, and they take whatever money they make and plow, plow it back into the business. But... Um, those RSLs are out there looking for accommodation. And, and actually, you know, there are just whatever's happening with lockdown and with COVID, there is still a supply-demand supply imbalance in the UK. And so people have to live somewhere. And mm. so what we're seeing, and we are, we're looking at, at actually a, a pretty significant size deal with, a, with a, um, a social landlord at the moment, um, we are seeing strong demand in the right areas. But it's usually higher volume stuff. You know, you need to generally be talking about 50, 100 units plus Yes, yes, yes. That that becomes a, a very good play and a and a and a and, and a um, good proposition. Odd, oddly, it's very difficult to get rid of five or ten social housing units. It's not enough to get them interested. If you if you've got you know fifty, they'll bite your hand off. So. So um, listen, I'm going to throw at you all a final question, completely uh, off the cuff. So we we've got another two three weeks of lockdown probably. Um, what would you recommend um, that I want just one idea or skill or something that people should go out there and learn or brush themselves uh, or brush up on or acquire new particular skills so that when we come out of lockdown um, they have something that will equip them for, for 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 something ahead. I mean, if you're asking, if you're recommending people spend their time to do something. Uh, to learn or brush up on a particular skill, what would that be? For me, that's meditation. Mm-hmm. Meditation? I think, yeah, I think this time is actually, I think we'll look back and realise it's been a lot more stressful than we maybe necessarily gave it credit for. Um, I'm big into meditation, I've been into that for a while, do it every morning for an hour or two hours and, and, and yeah, really sets me up for the day, so... I, I, yeah, I mean, start with three minutes, you know, start something really easy and manageable, but it, it, it's actually life changing. No, I agree. I mean, I think, um, yeah. Susanna, what, what would you be your suggestion? So um, I'm going to assume that you've got the skill of sourcing deals and raising finance. 
okay because those if you don't those are the two that you need to get into if you're talking about property mm. um, so for me it would be tech now i'm not a natural tech person but i am getting there and a really important a conversation about three years ago with Matt Elder, who also uh, writes about tech for Property Investor News, and who you know. Mm. We've we'll um, been doing some videos with Matt reviewing tech as it applies to property entrepreneurs later. So subscribe, uh, like, all of that jazz. Sorry, Susanna, carry well, on. He he and I are quite good friends, and we 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 give each other mm. a chat on the phone. And his comment is, "I spend a thousand four hundred a year on what you spend seventy grand on salaries on." Now that's quite something. Um, and so I do think that whole automation that, that, that basically tech is now available for people like me who don't have the technical skills and I don't do code because they've got they've done that and they've moved it forward. And I think property investors generally are very slow at tech and automation and we should be looking for efficiencies in our business. Don't forget we're running businesses. And, and so let's get efficiencies. That's going to come home to roost in the next five, ten years in a big, big way. Fully agree. Um, Evan, what's your thought? It's interesting, actually, what Susanna said about tech. Also very interesting what um, what uh, Helen said about meditation. I also meditate a little bit. I don't know that I could meditate for two hours. I can meditate for about 15 minutes, but maybe I'm just a bit less patient than Helen is. I'm not sure. Um, but I do find that it's great clearing your mind. Um, and you know, on the tech side of things, um, I've, my background's in the technology industry, so it's something that I bought into the business really from, from when I started it. And actually, in many ways, relied perhaps too much on it to do too much on my own without building a team. And then suddenly found when I had to build a team that um, that consumed an enormous amount of time and effort. What I would say is that this is a great time to actually make your business run more efficiently, as Susanna said, but also, and, and we've taken the time to do that, but also to pursue new opportunities you know things maybe that you haven't done to put your business in a better shape to actually grow as we come out of lockdown and again that's something that we've been doing with we're, we're in the process of developing a series of, of investment products um, that's something that we have been able to do because we've just had a little bit more bandwidth to be able to focus on that side of things while we're in lockdown but we've also focused on getting our existing team running much more efficiently we've been able to spend a, a lot more time with one another um, that the challenge has been has been managing the number of Zoom calls. I think it's very easy to, to spend all day on Zoom calls and not get any work done. That is so. true. I I I I know you guys have been the same, but I feel I I'm sure I've spoken at more events during lockdown than at any sort of eight week period of my life. It's been. <laughs> you've got to control the you've got to control the Zoom calls. If you're on them all day, you never think yeah. So, yes, yeah. that's true as well. That is very true. Okay, listen, guys, and uh, if you want to hear my views uh, on what you should learn, well, just um, subscribe and like, and you get notified when we release a video because we put out new videos all the time. Listen, guys, it's been absolutely great. Thanks for all your comments. Do tell us what you think about this format. I mean, when we get back and we can do the live Baker Street events in, in London. They will be the sort of uh, presentational format from experts. But on the live stream, we're going to do a slightly different format, which is more of a chat show format, and try to have some engaging conversation about property-related topics with some key people in the industry and people have got um, valuable sort of contributions. And I think what it's about, it's about um, – understanding because all these people that I've invited today they're very successful people they've done a huge amount in property and it's about not just you know seeing some you know things on a slide and some strategies and some that kind of stuff this chat show format is try, is trying to give an insight into how these sort of successful people actually think um, when I ask a question or we we have a question come from the floor you see that there's a certain entrepreneurial difference in the way they frame their answers to the questions and it gives you an insight into uh, the way their minds work. And quite frankly, if you want what they're getting, you've got to form the habits that, that they have and uh, and do the kind of things that they're doing. Uh, and then you'll get similar sort of results. So it's, it's more, it's, it's a mindset thing. Perhaps this chat show format is to get into the mindset of successful entrepreneurs as we talk about property related topics. And the live events is more about the strategies when we hear people present um, and, uh, and and give their views. Now, uh, tell us what you think about the format um, in the comments. Uh, keep the comments coming because these guys are going to uh, um, be watching this on replay and they will be wanting to see all their fans. And uh, I'm sure if you said nasty things, they'll, 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 they know where you are. They'll find you. 
uh, and they'll fish you out and uh, you'll hear from them uh, very, very shortly. Guys, any final words? Just good luck um, to everybody, you know. Yeah. Uh, make it happen, go for it, work hard, good luck. Yeah, look for the opportunities. I think um, it's it's been really great ch chatting with you guys, but great time to be looking for new opportunity. Go and find new ways of doing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. There's going to be a lot of opportunities out there and stay happy and healthy, everybody. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So uh, stay tuned for more opportunities on this channel. Like, subscribe, comment. Until next time, uh, thanks for joining. I mean, we have, uh, well, pretty much kept all our viewers on <laughs> they've all been cap they've been captivated by the words of our panel today uh, and everyone stayed on till the end that's absolutely wonderful and thanks for your comments and questions until next month last uh, wednesday of every month we do this uh, this this baker street uh, live stream uh, keep well keep safe and keep looking for those opportunities bye for now